Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth with your host, Angelo Ponzi. I am Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining me. I'm going to say it. I'm excited about this topic that we're going to talk about today. So imagine working six weeks and taking two weeks off. I'm in. How about you? I think that would be great. I would love to be able to concentrate it all, take a little bit short vacation every six weeks. I think that would be fantastic. So what the hell am I talking about, frankly? I'm not sure yet. That's why I have my guest coming on, um, Joe Martin. He's an author, an entrepreneur, and a speaker, and he's got a book and a process out called Six Week Cycle. Now, I'm really excited to kind of dig into it. I've done some research on this, but I'm still a little confused about how it's going to work. I tried to pitch this idea to my to my wife, and she said, absolutely not. So I need some input. I want you to have some input today. I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion because, again, it changes the way we think. Now, if you listen to the show, you know I used to work in an advertising agency, and we used to have to track time. Everything was project-driven, time-driven. It was so important. So Joe says we're obsessed with that, and so I want to dig into that as well. So I think this is going to be, again, interesting for all of us that are out there in this gig economy that are working independently. We're all these uh, small businesses, and, and we're so focused on on being there and time and what's going on and time dines and blah, 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 blah. So stay tuned. This is going to be a lot of fun. Again, my guest is Joe Martin, an author, an entrepreneur and speaker and author of Six Week Cycle. Your strategic plans are essential to managing your business's growth. Spend the time to develop a cohesive roadmap to follow to ensure your entire team is moving in the right direction. These plans should take the insights and the brand strategy work you've already completed to help you achieve your long-term business and growth objectives, as well as keep you competitive. These are actionable plans and should include the details of achieving your growth, including tactical implementations, timelines, budgets, and KPIs for success. Developing your plan is a team sport. Make sure you include the stakeholders from each of your strategic departments in your organization because everybody in the company is impacted by the success or failure of your plans. The following are six key questions to ask yourself. Do you have a clear understanding about what you're trying to achieve? Number two, what does your brand stand for in the eyes of your customers? Three, why do your customers buy from you? Four, what are your competitors doing? And five, what is your approach to sales? Where are your opportunities for revenue coming from? And number six, how can you differentiate yourself from your competition? Visit theponzigroup.com to learn more. As I mentioned, I'm talking to Joe Martin. We're going to dig into his new book and his process called Six Week Cycle. Joe, welcome to the show. Angelo, I get to follow in the footsteps of some of the greats here. This is this is wonderful to be on here. I'm a uh, fan. I'm already a fan uh, of the podcast. All right. I got a fan, everybody. And it's not just electric. Like I keep telling uh, people, all my fans are electric, but not Joe. He's real. And um, so I'm excited to have him on the show. I think, we, as you heard in the preamble, we have a, a really interesting topic that we're going to talk about. But before we jump into that, Joe, why don't you take a few minutes and, and tell the audience about you and your business and put you in context to the discussion we're about to have? Sure. I am a Chicago entrepreneur, author and TEDx speaker who I, I, I fight against the digital world. I feel like I've learned so much about the digital world so I can fight against it so we can start getting back to real world communities, real world interactions that I want to find out what happens when people have more time to spend on themselves, with their family and in their community. That You know what? That's really interesting. Uh, a friend of mine and uh, her name is uh, Leilani. I don't know if you if you know Leilani out here. You do. Okay, you, you know her. She posted this morning on LinkedIn that she was basically cutting herself off from the digital world for a few days. She is tired of Zooming. I, I actually responded and said, I think I have Zoomitis as well. I'm tired. I drink too much coffee. All I can think about is playing golf, you know, and and, it, and it's true. I mean, we spend so much time interfacing on zoom these days i, I mean literally I, I woke up this morning and i was looking at my schedule and i was like 
oh man, after the podcast, I got like four Zoom meetings and I almost I'm dreading it. And and then I'll get a call and say, hey, is everything OK? What are you talking about? Well, we haven't seen you on LinkedIn like 15 times this week like you normally do. It's like <laughs> taking a break, man. I, I, I can't do that. So I, I, have, I have a lot of empathy for what you're talking about. And and I won't say sympathy, but empathy, um, because it is it's it's overwhelming. And, and because of covid and because we're doing it this way. But I have to admit uh, on Tuesday was the first, no, not the first meeting I've had face-to-face, but the first business meeting where it was a, a new client, new prospect, where I actually went to their offices and spent a couple hours there. It was so refreshing to actually be out. In the, and and I, in, in audience, you can't see him, but it, Joe's wearing a jacket today. And I actually put on a jacket and a, and a collared shirt and my clean, my nice dress shoes. It was crazy. I think it's the first time I've worn them in, what, seven months. It's crazy. My big question is, were you able to get a the Ponzi Group branded face mask printed in time for the meeting? Oh, no. You know what? I didn't do that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I have some uh, uh, semblance of respect for myself here. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I get so much flack about my name anyway. The last thing I want to do is go around broadcasting my last name to people. I'd be spending all my time telling them the story of uh, Charles Ponzi. And, and it actually comes up. I mean, in, in all seriousness, on an average day, I get it five, six times. I mean, from complete strangers, somebody will... They'll send me a LinkedIn request and in the request, they'll say, uh, dude, what about your name? Or, you know, I can't believe your last name is it's like, what do you mean? I, I didn't do that. <laughs> frankly, <laughs> frankly, Charles Ponzi didn't even do that. It was it was Madoff that made it infamous. I mean, prior to really Madoff, it was there. It would you know, you'd hear about it, but it is everywhere. It's in books. It's in television. It's in movies. And it's not even the same. It's anything that has to do with any kind of scheme becomes a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And it's, it's not even the same thing. And I was telling somebody the other day that when I was younger, my, I lived in a small town and in our hometown paper, you know, 48, 72 point type, whatever it was, Ponzi scheme. My dad went freaking crazy because he thought it was talking about him. Right. Because he didn't know. <laughs> he didn't read it. He just saw the headline and he was screaming around the house and throwing shit. And and uh, turned out to be, of course, it was somebody in Hollywood that got got sch- schemed out of some stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, and I'm talking and you should be talking. But uh, one more story. Oh, the last name plays like some, someday <laughs> when I have my son and I name him Dean. <laughs> totally different story. We got a little Dean Martin walking around. There you go. <laughs> With a little martini glass. <laughs> and a candy cigarette. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That is funny. Those are the good old days, those uh the, the rat pack. I love that. Same. Anyway, let's uh let's segue away from me and to you. So a couple things before we kind of jump into into what we're gonna talk about is you do have a, a creative business, and I said I wasn't going to talk a lot about that, but but you have a creative business. So, but in general, when you think about growing your business, mm-hmm. what keeps you up at night? Uh, I mean, right now I'm actually I'm doing real well. I'm I'm making the right connections, and you're catching me on my two week break. That this is the time when it's about working on the business, planning for what happens next, and my upcoming six week cycle just. Looks good. Work is there. Clients are there. I know what I need to go do. And yeah, not not really struggling right now. Staying up too late. All right. I like that. Not watching too many movies on Netflix or anything like that. I mean, I am rewatching The Mandalorian. I just finished Cobra Kai again. So yeah. Well, uh, well, the new one, uh, Mandalorian, comes out tomorrow, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a fan of that as well. What's the best business advice? you've ever received as business advice was it wasn't necessarily direct advice, but it was uh, an old manager of mine. He was the CTO of a company called field glass in Chicago. And now he's the head of a company called catalytic, but we were talking about vacation days and he told me how he always wanted people to use all of their vacation days in a year and not roll them over because he wanted them to take a break. He wanted them to step away from the business. And I don't think I realized how much that impacted me at the time, but it planted a seed that, yeah, we we need to step away. We do better when we can actually take a little bit of time away and come back to something refreshed. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, I I would say during, you know, my corporate days, I did roll them over a few times, but I always tried to take them off. As a matter of fact, I, I was talking to some of my, a uh, couple of my boys the other day and asked them if they took their vacation and they said, yeah, their, their company is use it or lose it. It's not a, it's not a rollover. So they can't cash it out. It, they're forcing them. So I really like that because to your point, you do need to take a break. Yeah. And, I was doing unlimited vacation days for my team, uh, which I think was one of those big tech things that everyone started to say that just, Oh, you're a tech company. Yeah. Unlimited vacation. How great. Uh, but then what I started to find out was I never actually gave my employees permission to use those vacation days. I overloaded them every time with projects that they never felt like they could actually step away. And more problems came that I felt like it was on me for that. Well, you know, that's, that's interesting because, you know, as a, and, and I've owned my own businesses or agencies before, and I had a lot of employees and all that kind of stuff. And, and you try to get them empowered to feel that way. But to your point, if you're just throwing stuff on them constantly and not giving them ways to either offload that, they, they, hopefully there's a dedication there. I can't leave because I can't abandon my clients and, and, and you always have to try to figure that out. Otherwise that's kind of perpetuates that I can never get away. Yeah. And that gets into some of that work-life balance that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Which is uh, a we sham. All, work-life balance is a sham. Yeah, into that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, it's, it's the Holy grail. I, I've had other people on the show and, and, in talking about work-life balance and it, and it's, where is it? I mean, I feel like I, I've got to be uh, uh, Indiana Jones, you know, <laughs> and the Raiders of the uh, work-life balance because I can't find it. I try, but man, I can't find it at all. You've written a book. You have a, a process, if you will, called six week cycle. Now it's a, it, it's more than a concept. It's something you're, it's practical. You mentioned it earlier on. You're in your two week cycle. So Let's let's talk about that, because the one question I did have before you jump into it is, is it you work six weeks and, and take vacation for two weeks? But that didn't sound like you took vacation. It sounds like you were working on your business, which I'm a big advocate for. Too many people do not spend time working on their business. They're working in a day to day and they're not thinking they're not planning and not being strategic. So why don't we kind of jump into that? Give me the overall premise and then I've got a bunch of questions. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of like a, it's going from 80% productivity on a cycle to about 20% productivity off the cycle. That I'm, I'm still going to answer emails. I'm still going to jump on and do podcasts when amazing people ask me to be a part of it. And that's the kind of stuff, though, that I'll try to work on in these two weeks. And really, the, the goal of these two weeks is just to plan the next six weeks so that we know week four four on Thursday, we're reviewing this design, that when we can start to look that far ahead, it makes it so much easier to understand what do we need to do and set better expectations with the company, the client, everyone. Is it a, is it a better project management process? I believe so. Uh, it, it forces you to step through. So we, it's, it's a little risk mitigation. We figure out what's coming up. We get the chance to ask questions in advance instead of interrupting the client saying, hey, we need this now and we need it right away or you're going to hold up our production. That we kind of get the chance to look at all the pieces, plan them all out, see who's going to do it all, make sure everyone understands what's coming up for them. And that's the big one is uh, I feel like a lot of the corporate working world right now is if you go through and bust your ass and get everything you need to get done by Thursday, that your reward on Friday is more work. Is more work. <laughs> That's true. It is. I wanted to be in the spot where I can tell my employees, look, this is what you need to get done this week. Here's what is expected of you. If you get all this stuff done by Thursday, take Friday off. Like, yeah, give, give yourself that reward. But here are the items I need from you in order to move the business forward. I don't need your time. I need your productivity. And that's, and that's an interesting, uh, position to take because there is time versus productivity. And, and, and so a lot of times when, when we, I had my agency, we would have, and I didn't give them Friday off, but, but similar flexibility that you had certain things to accomplish. You could accomplish it in an hour. You can accomplish it in two hours, but, 
but you could take a longer lunch. You could, you know, come in a little bit later, those kinds of things, because it really is about, and for me, it was empowering them to manage their time to accomplish what they needed to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And if they did what they did, I don't know, you know, why you needed to stick around until seven o'clock at night. So I had these, I had these partners and I'm sure they're not listening, but it was many years ago. Um, and they would come in and because they like to work late and I worked late, but because they like to work late, if people left, they, they would get upset. And a lot of times it was my people because I had more people than, than everybody else. And it was like, your people are leaving too early. I said, it's six o'clock at night. Well, we're here working. Yeah, but you didn't come in to 9, 9.30 and, and their work is done. They're just sitting around being busy because they're afraid cause, cause to leave because you're going to say something. Yeah. And and I think that that's, that was wrong. And we used to fight about that all the time. And eventually I, I kind of won out on that. But I never wanted people to feel they have to stay there just because. Yeah, that's that's an industrial revolution style mindset where there was a time when the only way we could judge a person's productivity was by how much time they spent in a location doing things. And we're done with that. COVID has killed the industrial revolution work mindset and that we have the, the chance to build a new one going forward. One that needs to be more flexible, especially because I feel people need to be there for their kids. Like it, it's your kids, Marty, it's your kids. You have to, we have to be able to have this time to be there, to be flexible for what they need, when they need it, to help them with school, that we we can't just say nine to five, you need to be logged on to Skype or Slack and you need to get your work done during those times. There's too many distractions. There's too much stuff that comes up. We need to look at more productivity-based environments. Yeah, the, the, the distractions are incredible. It, it, I've, I, in this car, we're, we're obviously online talking and I turned off my email and somehow I'm still getting notices popping up and I have no <laughs> idea how that's happening. And, and so I must've pushed some button, but it's, but it's distracting because it pops up. I, I glance down at it and cause it's right there in my face. And I think managing that and setting time, I, I, one of the complaints I had in, in one of the groups I belong to, and they were saying, you know, uh, give each other tips. And somebody said to me, what I do is I turn off my phone, and I say for the next hour or two hours, I'm going to focus on the assignment at hand. I'm going to totally disconnect myself from the world and, and do that job. And then at the end of the two hours or whatever it is, I'll turn my phone back on. I'll turn my email back on. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. And it's simple. Why didn't I think of that? But it made made such a difference because I wasn't thinking about other things. And to me, if like if it's that important they can wait an hour, they can wait two hours, or frankly, if it's really that important, they're going to call somebody else in the office to come get me. And, and I, and so I still try to practice that as much as possible. And, mm -hmm. and, and actually uh, my, my wife, who's, who uh, is a, a marketing and, and branding expert, you know, she always says to me, you, you're, you got to be careful because I start to wander and do lots of different things at the same time. And it's like, you got to focus, you got to stop chasing, you know, chasing the shiny pennies every time they pop up in front of you. Yeah, there was a there was a UC Irvine study that uh, said that one distraction is equal to a loss of 25 minutes of productivity, which that means two distractions. And we're looking at 50 minutes of productivity gone, which let's say 25 minutes is overblown, that that's way too much, even if it's a five minute loss of productivity. When you start to think about how many distractions you get from from Slack or Microsoft Teams, from text message, from email, from just something else that just popped into your head that you said, oh, shit, I should go do this real quick, that we're, we're just chalking it up. And then that that time can be better spent for more organized. That would mm -hmm. be so nice. Instead of people saying, I have no time to actually feel like they have some of that back. Is that part of your process in, in, in your training, if you will, with your employees that how to manage the day to day? It is. It, it's what we talk through. Uh, so we have two big meetings on cycle every week and it's Monday to review your upcoming Google sheet. We've got a Google sheet that I set up that people can grab at six cycles.com that takes you through mapping out the day and you break down your tasks into planning tasks, communicating tasks and doing tasks. And we'll, we'll look through those together to say, what do you have coming up? Let's step through every day. 
There's so much behind just that visualization aspect. And then we have another meeting on Friday. Uh, and that meeting is simply a what went well, what didn't go well meeting. So we spend two minutes in silence over Zoom and we write down everything that went well that week. Then we share it. Then we take another two minutes in silence. I set a timer on my phone, write down everything that didn't go well and share that. And those small meetings seem to just do so much for the culture and for the productivity that now all of a sudden on Friday, people have the opportunity to celebrate their wins. And we force them to look back at your week to say, what did go well? And then on that same side, talk about what didn't go well. And Angela, you're not going to believe this, but sometimes people just want to bitch. Sometimes they just want to vent and say, this sucked. And then they're done. And then they can move on past it and let it go instead of hanging on to it and harboring it. That they, they have an environment to say this sucked for someone to hear it, recognize it, and then move on and get back to the important things. Well, part of this is, it, I mean, in, implementation in your business, but for other businesses that adopt this, it really is a top down. I mean, the leader has to give that empowerment. No? All right. think, for, for that stuff, yes. For some of the bigger items. But I actually hope for a bottom up approach with this that I think even in corporations, this should be as simple as an employee going to their boss and saying, what do I need to get done over the next two months? I want to know what I need to get done. I think we have a right to know what we have coming up. That if your manager says, I don't know, you you push them, you say, I want to know what I have coming up. Like that's, I think that's your right. And if you can figure out what you have to get done for the next eight weeks, figure out how to do it in six. Well, and I think it's going to be, somewhat to, and you can correct me if i'm wrong but dependent on the type of business yeah right i mean if you're in a project driven you know in the in, in again i'll go back to the agency because that's how I, I i mean i i see how this could have worked brilliantly in the agency because we were even even like even if we were on fee base with clients so there's still projects everything's driven by projects this ad or this you know, digital campaign or this website, whatever it happens to be, television commercial, because we are doing media buys. And and so we have to work within a time frame. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, 15 hours a day. There were those days, but it didn't necessarily have to be that if you were you could structure your day better because you knew what was coming up. You had that project workflow. Mm -hmm. And 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 six and two is not the magical formula. That I think really it's about businesses just looking of when do we give our employees this breathing room and when do we even give ourselves this breathing room to work on the business. That maybe it's maybe it's a three in one, maybe it's a four in one, but it's about just understanding just when do we have this break, when do we have this time to reflect, adjust, and then move forward. How how, how long did it take for your um, employees to embrace this? One more time. Sorry, I missed that question. How many? How many? How how long? When you introduce this concept and this process to your employees, how long did it did it take them to really go, oh, yeah, this is real, I love this, or you know, embrace it and really work with it? Uh, so I did it with my team first, and for the first year, it was a failure. That it was our second or third cycle of trying this. We masterfully planned everything that needed to happen over those next six weeks. We had a super detailed list of here's everything that's going to happen every week. And then it was on the third day of the cycle that all of a sudden a new project came in and completely undid everything that we talked about doing. Mm -hmm. And the whole cycle was shot. The team was like, look, this was stupid. Why do we even try and do this way? We can't get a hold on this. And we kept pushing through. Uh, but then we built a digital product. We had that acquired about six months after we launched. And then I was made director of product for an international remote team. And there I had the chance to now try it out that we had people in Australia, South Africa, Arkansas, Chicago, Vancouver, Toronto. They were all over the place. And I had the chance to kind of roll this system out. And we found the culture between ourselves and even some of the teammates in South Africa that without ever having actually met, it helped to just motivate everyone. It, it helped to say, here's the beginning of a cycle. Here's the goals we have set out. Here's the projects we're going to work on. And then at the end of the cycle to say, here's what we did. Here's what was accomplished. That we started to give the organization a heartbeat. 
that all of a sudden there, there was an up and down, that there was things that people could follow and grasp onto. And one of the customer support people in South Africa uh, had sent me a message saying, for the first time, I feel like I'm actually a part of the team. Yeah, I, that's great. I, I mean, I, I'm as we're talking, I mean, I, 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 I'm imagining just in my own business right now, I have several projects going on and, and there's always that push and pull of how, how do you manage certain things? Even when I was, and I, and really this morning I was thinking to myself is, you know, I, 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 you know, obviously I do podcasts, but sometimes they're spread out over the week and maybe instead of putting them all on a day, same thing with meetings and, you know, just the organization to give me more time. I literally go into my calendar because I, I have a calendar link calendly link mm -hmm. and people book meetings all the time. I have a meeting this afternoon. I don't even remember who it is or why, why they clicked on it. And so I have to go figure that out. You know, if somebody grabbed my link and it's a sales pitch. I don't really have time for a sales pitch today yeah. to me. And so, so that's a, that's a disruption. Do I need that disruption? Because I, I have other things that I need to accomplish. So on your, I believe it was your website, you, you talk about, you know, training for entrepreneurs, coaches and advisors and team training. And, and you kind of talk about this program within those kind of three buckets. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk a little bit about the benefits of, and the one that really caught my eye, frankly, was coaches and advisors perceive value and raise prices. <laughs> have, have a new tool in your toolkit that there's, there's the, the help you can do in a business and advisor. You can, you can look at the finances, you can help them straighten things out there. I think on our side, we look at things like marketing, conversion funnels, how you do stuff there. You can improve your sales process. But then I feel like there's a break between that and then you get into kind of executive coaches and kind of more this leadership of, hey, we're gonna develop you as a human. And this idea of the six week kind of falls in the middle of yes we need to work on the business we also need to work on you as a human but we need to get time organized first and i need you to have time to even work on these things i need you to have you need to get your email under control if you don't that's going to prevent so many other things and what i think that then that impacts is the ability to even effectively manage your team that when you have a manager who can't get their schedule under control they just push things down onto other people in the organization and so I would want to help arm advisors with this tool to say, yeah, here's here's one more way that I can actually go help someone with their business. And let's start getting it into one that understands more about the person on the other side of it. So how many um, So, as you're implementing this program, I would imagine you also have to maybe you don't talk to your clients about this. So they understand that there's this ebb and flow now that's that maybe wasn't the norm before. And the other part of this question is adoption of other other organizations that have now implemented your program and you know kind of success or no, not not success that they've had with it so multi-part question yeah on the on the client side uh all of my clients now work with us in six week cycles that they understand this is part of the process uh it's very much a kind of advising role within marketing as well that at the beginning of the cycle we do a one hour cycle kickoff together and we go through that we say, what do you have coming up? And this is what we're working on. And then we'll have a check-in every week during the cycle. And then we have a cycle closed together that we do another one hour. And I've never seen, uh, I haven't seen marketing agencies take that much of an active role in communication with an employee. That it usually just says, oh, we'll just give you status updates. We'll just send you an update about what happened. And then, oh, this is done. Now let's schedule a meeting to do it. Whereas right now my clients are already scheduled with meetings out through the middle of December that we know exactly when we're meeting every week, what's going to happen. And we're able to just roll with that in terms of other companies implementing this. I, I don't have enough data and feedback on that. I kind of put it out there and let them run it themselves as I haven't done as much kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching specifically with a company to say, Hey, let's really dig in and do this. Okay. And this, your book is relatively new, right? It just came out not too long ago. Yeah, just came out last year. And uh, at the time, it was looking more like I'd be able to focus and work with companies on that. Uh, but I ended up building a new product in the tourism space that was looking like it was going to get adopted. And then then COVID hit. I was going to say, yeah, it's probably a little behind uh, schedule with yeah. that. <laughs> 
Uh, well, yeah, and and I know a lot of people in the in the in the tourism and, and cruise industry, and and certainly that industry has been impacted quite a bit um, by COVID. Let's let's kind of move on a little bit then in talking about this work life balance and and how your program it helps achieve but work life balance in, in general. And again, I mean, as I said, that's kind of like the holy grail that we all talk about. And I've had numerous over the years, uh, well, I guess years now, two years as I head into my third year of doing podcasts, people come in and talk about that. And it, and it's still elusive. There's a lot of, uh, I had a guy on, and I'll talk about him a, a little bit later on, and about his philosophy. I had a guy out, out of England that has a, a, a happiness measurement uh, for employees. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> all this crazy stuff to help people, you know, enjoy their work and, and achieve that work-life balance. But you said or a few minutes ago or whenever we started this, you have some very strong opinions about work-life balance. So I'm going to let you take it. (laughs) Uh, Work takes over too much that uh, we don't give people breathing room. It's very much the, the idea of a nine to five, 40 hours a week is what's expected. And I think that we, we strip people of motivation. We talked about you finish all your work by Thursday, you get more work on Friday and that we, we let people settle for doing less uh, for just getting through the work day. And I think that that attitude then comes home into your life. And I think that when you leave the work week feeling unmotivated or like you busted your ass and got nothing done, how does that play into how you talk to your children and how your children see you? How does that affect your impact of saying, man, yeah, the world's messed up. Holy shit. These are the two people we're left with as presidential candidates. How do we make some change? Oh, it's impossible to make change because we feel like we can't even make change in our own workplace. And so I feel like when we start getting more structured with this, that all of a sudden you can start to manage what you have to do. And my hope is that that opens up people to have more time with their family, have more time in their community, that maybe on those two weeks, you can go donate your time to doing something in your local community for a little bit, instead of taking your money that's already been taxed and donating it to an organization that's gonna tax it again when they pay out stuff that let's just, let's just go help the people around us. Yeah. You know, it, and I think it's, it's, it's something you have to commit to. And I, I don't want to use the word plan for, but you, you have to organize. I mean, it, it's simple. <laughs> I cleaned my garage this weekend and we spent literally probably eight hours cleaning stuff out because I have three boys and they're older. And I mean, I'm finding stuff from second grade. They, <laughs> they don't want it. It's time to get rid of it. And at the end, you know, we felt accomplished. And even though it was a lot of hard work and we actually have to go back and finish this weekend because we managed to get one side clean, the other side's filled with all the crap we didn't throw away yet. And, and, and so just to schedule that, it literally has taken almost two months Mm-hmm. to figure out how we're going to schedule the timing of all that and all the things that have to be done. And, and so for us, that was very rewarding. And, and, you know, we strive for that balance. And I, and I was very fortunate when my kids were younger, when I was starting my original advertising agency, it was actually in this office. And, and so my kids were young and I was here all the time where my wife was actually getting in a car and going to a, an office. And so you know, I got to experience what you're talking about and seeing the kids constantly there and going to the ball games. I, I think in, in all the years, I only missed a handful of, of baseball games or lacrosse games. I mean, not very many. It was a it was really important to me to get there. OK, so it's, it's that idea of being able to spend time with your family that I don't think should be resolved or reserved just for business owners. And that. That so many times, I don't know how people kind of rise up in the ranks and then treat the people below them with less respect. That it's, it's very much that this is what we all want. Everyone wants to be able to enjoy their time. And why not work to create that culture with your team where everyone gets to have it, which I, I know is a mindset. I am very much an in the trenches kind of leader that I want to I want to be there with you that if I want to work in six for six weeks and take off for two, I want you to work for six weeks and take off for two as well. That it's not just something I, it shouldn't just be reserved for the top. Yeah. And, and I, and I love that. I, I, I did some consulting work for an organization and I mean, the, the CEO would, you know, she'd like bought us a, a suite to uh, um, uh, 
Charger Stadium, for example. And the way they would do it, all the kind of elitist top people got to go in the limo to the stadium and all the people, the other 150 people knew about it because they talked about it and they wore their jerseys and made a big deal about it. And everybody else was like, well, why can't I go to any of these things? And it was this constant, we're the bosses, you know, we're the leaders and, you know, you're the minions. And I, 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 and I actually, as a consultant, I said to her one day, you, you, you can't do that. You're, everybody's wondering why, you know, you guys get to do all this stuff and they don't. And they're the ones working to make you the money and you're treating them like second class citizens. And that's got to kind of change. It's it, it's a it's a long story. I'd love to talk to you about it sometime. But uh, but I but I want to go segue now. I was listening to one of your presentations, one of your TED Talks. And you started talking about the field of dreams. And, and I talk about, you know, uh build it and they will come all the time, which is a horrible, horrible, horrible strategy. <laughs> but you started talking about Archibald Graham. Now, and you had a line in there and, and I've actually, obviously I've seen this movie like a dozen times, but when you started talking about it, it really sunk into me. And, and so I don't want to give the line away. I'm going to let you talk about it and what it meant and, and, and really get into your, your program. But I have to say it actually had a profound effect when I really thought about it and I wrote it down and I, I'm probably going to steal it. And and it really meant something. So why don't you talk a little bit about the importance of that line? Yeah, uh, the line is that we don't recognize the most important moments of our life while they're happening to us. And it, as I looked back at my own life, this felt true. That I was like, yeah, I, I never thought that a random trip to service merchandise on a Sunday afternoon with my father would lead to me playing guitar and getting the chance to tour around the U S with a band that, that we don't see it until it's this idea of hindsight. And I, I have a fascination for time travel. I love the idea of time travel. And so I started wondering what is, what is the opposite world? What is the one that if, if we don't recognize the most important moments in our life, what's the version where we do, what's the version where we, where we can recognize this thing is going to be this impactful. And I think that that's where we, we need that opportunity to look forward to, to plan what's coming up, to plan how we want to handle it, what's going to happen is the outcomes from that. And that all of a sudden we, we get the chance to write our future a little bit, that we can start to identify those important moments before they happen. Yeah. And I, I think that in, in, in coming off of what you just said, by if we're doing something, it's not about the moment. It's about the impact in the future. And and, and I'm thinking about some of the things like my, my kids are doing and they're doing something that's today that's going to impact. They see it in the next six months. But the reality is that some of that could impact forever. And yeah. and so I, I, it's a great way to look at it. I my father um, was a was because he had passed. He was a plumber and he had me working for him. And I was like 12 years old. Right. Child labor. <laughs> and uh <laughs> And when I was home for a family reunion last year, about August, uh, not this year, in 2018. And as I was sitting there waiting to go to the reunion, I, I started flashing back on all this stuff. And I started writing it down about all the things he had me do, which I hated with a passion. But I realized whether they were real lessons or maybe in my own mind lessons, things that impacted me as an adult. And so I, I wrote about it and I'm you know, I've been saying this. I'm working on a book. I need more time. I need my two weeks to finish that book. And, and but I did a podcast on it and stuff, and it was really impactful. And I really think about the things we learned and we pass on and we do. And and so this idea that you were talking about time travel, I thought was was brilliant. If we could go back and and do things like that. So I'm going to ask you a quick question. Yeah. What would Joe? tell his 18 year old or 15 year old self uh, you could go back to, to connect with the right people that I think the, the older I've gotten, the, the more experience is that the whole world operates with who, you know, you talked about the, the kid who's 23, who is helping to write operas and stuff. You don't just get to do that. It's not just going to be a random 23-year-old in the middle of Oklahoma who all of a sudden is doing this amazing stuff. You have to know the right people. You have mm -hmm. to 
you know, when you have to help other people and have this abundance mentality of being able to go out there and do good for others. And, and it's, it's that it, it's to meet other people. But I think too many times I tried to pave the way myself instead of asking for help, instead of, instead of being able to talk to someone else and meet the right people who can help take me to that next level. There's been just, I've constantly just chipped away I've done what I can to fight to get next to get to the next level every time. So we're going to go back in history again. So if you could go back and, <laughs> and have one historical figure and one personal figure, who would it be? One historical and one personal. I, I'll give you mine while you're thinking about it. It's, it's yeah, a crazy yeah, thing, it. but but I I was always fascinated with General George Armstrong Custer. And I would love to not be at the Little Bighorn to see what actually happened. Not that I want to be in there, to, but I'd like to. I like. I was really fascinated with his history in the Civil War, and then on to uh, you know be an Indian fighter, and then lead that into the Little Bighorn. So that was always a fascination of mine. And on the personal side, knowing what I know, I would actually go back in time just prior to my mom getting dementia so I could have conversations with her that I never got to have. So that that's where I would go on a personal side. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, my, my personal is it's, it's always my grandmother that uh, getting the chance to go back and be able to see her again. That that's my big one. She was around a lot. My parents were entrepreneurs. They were running a business. My grandmother helped raise me. And so always seeing her and historical I, uh, you know what? I want to go back. Let me, let me get my hands on a Thomas Jefferson or someone else around that 1776 time. And let's just make a few more notes in the constitution that are going to apply 200 years. <laughs> there you go. I love that. <laughs> just going to rewrite the constitution a little bit. Yeah, hey, let's just let's people, yeah. Let's make it a little easier for ourselves today. Let's just put a few more footnotes in there. So when people are reading it, they're like, okay, yes, I have the right to bear arms, but maybe we don't need assault rifles if those ever come around. Yeah. Yeah, hey, hey, uh, George and uh, Tom and <laughs> Ben, come on, come on guys. <laughs> we told you guys about this thing on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine how blow their minds if they could if they could only see if they could only see what was going on? There's uh, the guy I was talking about the other day that I had uh, on the uh, show. His name was Bruno, um, and. His whole defin his whole thing is about employee happiness and welfare and empowering. And he's his whole concept is around the word love. Now, not you know, love thy neighbor kind of thing, but I guess a little more love thy neighbor, right? It's compassion, it's empathy, it's support, it's caring, it's affection, it's generosity, and it's gratitude. It's kind of the words that make up this idea of love that if if business owners really embraced their employees more that ultimately it leads to more productivity and it really kind of falls a lot along the lines of what you're talking about so much of what birthed the idea of the six week cycles uh stemmed from marketing that everything we do in marketing is about identifying the target customer let's understand their fears their motivations their objections and at one point I realized I knew more about my customer's motivations than I did my own employee motivations. And I knew more about how to increase lifetime value for a product than I did increasing the lifetime value of my own employee. And that's where then it started to look at, well, how am I treating my employees? What a, where's their motivation to do better? And that's where I think we look at those things of, yeah, if you work by Thursday, why don't you get Friday off? Yeah. Yeah, so many times in, it, it, when I look at a, a client and we're working on a marketing strategy or plan, part of mine is always about the employees, about their employees, because so many times they're overlooked. I, I mean, true stories, walking down the hallway and talking to, you know, whatever, the accounting manager and, hey, how do you like the new new uh, strategy and the position of the company, whatever it happens to be? And they have like no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> and yet we all agreed that, you know, they were going to embrace the employees and let them know because why? Because if you got a hundred employees, they walk out the door. It's a hundred brand ambassadors versus, Hey, who do you work for? X, Y, Z company. 
tell me about them. Oh, yeah, I'm their accounting manager. Well, but what do they do? What do you know about them? Who do they service? You know, they, a lot of times people have no idea about the inner workings of the company that they're working for, just the disciplines that they provide. And in, in, in that I always try to tell them when I when I work with them is we all make up the pieces of the puzzle. And without all of this, you know, the puzzle doesn't work. Right. And and so we need to think that way holistically. And I think you've probably heard me say that. I mean, I, I take a holistic approach. Someone says I was in a meeting and we had everybody in the room and the, the G, uh, president says to the head of sales, you know, what what's your one dream right now? What, what do you want? I want a million dollar order. Ah, everybody clapped and cheered. And I turned to the manufacturing guy. I said, if we got a million dollar order tomorrow, can we fulfill it? Absolutely not. We don't have the inventory. We don't have the people, it, you know, and, and finances. Well, I don't have the extra dollars to buy the inventory. I mean, all of a sudden, the million dollar order was going to cause the company a problem. And so to your point, people need to interact and understand that their contributions and what they do is to the greater good, not just, you know, I, I did the, you know, the, the marketing piece today. I mean, what happens after that? What's it for? What does it do? And I think that's really important. And, and, I'm, and I think you were, we're talking the talking the same language, most marketing guys. Yeah. And this is where I like the, the temporal landmarks that something like six week cycles creates, because now we have six distinct start and end points that people can grasp onto. That if you can communicate back out to the organization, hey, here's the goals for the next six weeks. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's what we're trying to get is all of a sudden you can help to encourage their motivation, to bring them more on board, to understand what's happening with the company, to like the, the customer service woman who wrote me back from South Africa to say, hey, I, I actually feel like I'm a part of the team because they knew more about what was happening. Well, listen, we covered a lot of stuff today and I really appreciate your time. I, 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 I'm going to figure out a way to put give your give your program a test i know and i'm going to let you tell people how to contact you and i know you mentioned you have a lot of stuff on your website um that they can get a hold of and, and utilize so why don't we turn that over to you tell people how they can contact you about all the good stuff that you have yeah if you want to if you want to find out me maybe watch the tedx talk about time travel that you can find at hi joe but if you're ready to give this six week cycles world a try head over to six week cycles.com and there is a free six week virtual coach where you're going to get a bunch of emails from me kicking your butt to start getting a little more organized, turning off your email, then turning on your email and making time for it. So I kind of take you through the steps of here's the smaller things we need to do to start getting your productivity in line. I love that. And, and I encourage you uh, listeners out there to watch the time travel uh, TED talk. I, I found it really fun. And very enjoyable. And again, the the Archibald um, Graham statement I, I, again, it really hit home. I mean, I've used the the other one, Field of Dreams, uh, uh, Build and They Will Come Forever, but this one just just resonated with me. So I'm going to thank you for the, for that and and doing that. So uh, and you're on LinkedIn and all that good stuff too, right? Did you mention? Yeah, that? I mean, there we're connected. And just find Angelo and you find me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank you and I want to thank you listeners out there who uh, tuned in today. If you're biz, here's my pitch. If your business needs a CMO or a senior level marketing executive, but you're not quite ready for a full time person yet, connect with me to find out more about my fractional interim or consulting services. You can visit the Ponzi group dot com to find out more I have a variety of resources there, blogs, videos, ebooks. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me anywhere. Just Google me. I Googled myself the other day. A lot of good stuff out there. Um, and I am not that Ponzi. I'm the other Ponzi. I did not create the scheme. So just in case you're wondering about that. And lastly, if you're a subscriber, thank you very much. If you're not a subscriber or you are a subscriber, please let everyone else know about the show and about this great content like we heard today. Um, you'll thank me and I appreciate it. You can go to businessgrowthcafe.com or subscribe on any podcast platform you like to listen to. And don't forget to join me next week here at the Business Growth Cafe. Joe, thank you so much for your time. Angel, thank you. This was really fun. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. 
Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.